Pakistan is in a state of confusion because it was born in a state of confusion. Hmm. That Pakistan was born in a state of confusion, but that is another aspect because Pakistan was not the cause. Pakistan was the victim of confusion. And here you say very blandly that he had no planning, there was no planning. It is very, very unkind for Dr. Parvez, who's boy, to, re, to use his considerable reputation to tar the image of the country and its founder. Today, we do not need an ideology for Pakistan. Countries survive without ideologies. Holland has no ideology, nor does Japan. Bismillah Rahman Rahim. In introducing the new edition of my book, Imagina, The Outside View, I want first to highlight the new chapter I have added for this edition. This chapter is a response to a talk given by Dr. Parvez Hudboy in the Karachi Adabi Festival 2020. I must begin by thanking Mr. Javed Jabbar for bringing this to my attention. In my own opinion, his own responses to Dr. Parvez Hudboy were good enough, but uh, he insisted that as a practicing historian, I should add the footnotes and by footnotes we meet references. So what I am going to do is I am going to give references to whatever I say and uh, that will be up to you. I will exhibit the books I have got and then it will be up to you to form your judgment. I have references written before me. So I can show them to you, I can read them out to you. So there can be no question of uh, anything being said without any documentation or any evidence. First thing that Dr. Parvez boy said that Pakistan is in a state of confusion because it was born in a state of confusion. He is right in saying that Pakistan was born in a state of confusion, but that is another aspect because Pakistan was not the cause. Pakistan was the victim of confusion. There are three books who, at least three books which describe the confusion that the British created, Lord Mountain Mountbatten created the Viceroy and by as a consequence Pakistan suffered and is still somewhat suffering from that confusion. So the first is eminent Churchillians, London, Widenfield and Nicholson, 1994. I'll read out three passages from this book. The second is by Stanley Walford, it's called Shameful Flight. Shameful Flight is a phrase taken from Winston Churchill's speech in the House of Commons when he criticized the manner the transfer of power was taking place. The third is, I've chosen it because Retreat, Empire and Retreat by Rabia Umar Ali, because Dr. Rabia Umar Ali teaches history at the Qaidi Azam University. And as such, I sh should uh, believe that Dr. Parvez boy should have been familiar with at least this would be most undesirable to lay down a procedure for self-determination which would give the wrong answer. See, that is what led to the Ratcliffe Award. And... Uh, <coughs> It was a 
Sir Algernon Rumbold, who said, the great mistake was to divide provinces simultaneously with transferring power. To the centre, it was most desirable for the central government in, to continue to be as strong as possible and in a position to at that point to superintend the partition of provinces for a few months before power was transferred at the center. To it all, to do it all on the same day created the ideal conditions for mistrust and massacre. Unacceptable demands were placed on police and army loyalty. Now you see this is the confusion against which Muhammad Ali Jinnah had warned. It was not a confusion he had created after all. Uh, he asked for the partition of the country finally when his 12th May 1946 proposals which considered a common centre between Muslim majority Hindu Muslim, and Hindu majority provinces were turned down. He even accepted the cabinet mission plan and it was certainly not Mr. Jinnah or the Muslim League, even Morana Azad whom you, you praise so much has admitted in India Britain's freedom that it was not Mr. Jinnah's fault, it was Mr. Nehru's fault that the cabinet mission plan fell through. So when a person is considering all the options, he is not confused. Whereas in he when events take place against his advice, he is not responsible for the confusion. We are in a state of confusion for two reasons. Firstly, there was a wide gulf between the Raj Gopalacharya formula, which showed West Pakistan and East Pakistan that Punjab and Bengal need only give the Muslim, the Muslim majority areas, not the Hindu majority areas. It was the Raj Kubalachari formula which suggested the partition of provinces. Mr. Jinnah had not wanted it and at one point in the meetings, uh, Mountbatten had said that Jinnah was right in saying that uh, the provinces were an entity. But what happened? Even that in the Radcliffe Award, Muslim majority areas for which there was a long, long correspondence with the first Lord Wavell, then with Lord Mountbatten, by Krishna Menon, by Papal Panguni Menon, and even Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru. Krishna Menon had asked Lord Von Batten to destroy his letter, but he preserved it. That's how it reached us. So, you can't make this accusation that Pakistan is in a state of confusion because it was created in a state of confusion. It was not created in a state of confusion on our side. A confusion was deliberately created by awarding Firozpur, Zira and above all that roadway to Kashmir that has caused the bitterness to linger Gurdaspur. Even in the 1946 minutes prepared, pre-prepared for the cabinet missions plan, even in the 1946 brief of the cabinet delegation for talks with Mr. Jinnah, it was stated that it will be possible to offer Mr. Jinnah Punjab only Muslim majority areas with the exception of Gurdaspur. So even before Lord Mountbatten arrived, it had been decided not to give Gurdaspur. That means it did not, it was decided not to give Kashmir to India. The basis of Pakistan as articulated by Muhammad Ali Jinnah was that there are only two nations that live on this subcontinent, 
They are mutually hostile. They cannot ever live in peace. That was part one. Part two was that Muslims form a nation. Well, the first is given Narendra Modi's ascent to power, something that we can talk about, that hostility exists between religions and between Hinduism and Islam, there was a particular kind of hostility. So we can talk about that, but the second part is completely nonsensical. You will see that I have the references before me, which I can show to you, so that you can see for your own eyes and check the references. Now, uh, Dr. Parvez, whose boy, has said that M Mr. Jinnah said there were only two nations in India. He did never use the word only. And I'll tell you presently, he was not the first person to give expression to the two nation theory. Uh, it was Jawaharlal Nehru who had said in 1936 that there are only two forces in India, the British and the Congress. This created a gulf because up till then the Muslim League and Congress had decided to cooperate against British backed parties like the United Party and the National Agriculturalist Party. Here also Jawaharlal Nehru became the spoiler and the cooperation was emerging, was sabotaged. Who did it? Who was the two nation theory you criticized so much? Let me give you a reference. Exact quotation, I am giving exact quotation. Mahatma Gandhi, after visiting a Mahasabha, uh, a Khara as it was called, a uh, place where they trained their youth in wrestling and other martial arts, wrote in Young India of 12th May 1929. What did he write? Every community, this is Mahatma Gandhi speaking, every community is entitled, even bound to organize itself if it is to live as a separate entity. This is the reality of the two nation theory. Because if the majority secedes, then the minority automatically stands seceded, separated. If the majority is going to be a separate entity, then the minorities, all the minorities will be separated. So that is the plain truth. It was Mahatma Gandhi, not Jinnah, who was the tuition theory first. Mr. Jinnah who we all hold in such great regard, is the founder of Pakistan. But he never was able to put down what that Pakistan was to be. He never wrote a single research paper. He never wrote an essay. He gave a lot of speeches which at different times said very different things. The accusation that Jinnah never wrote a research paper is absurd. He was a barrister and not a professor. And when a barrister prepared a brief, he did not rely only on the statutes. He had go through a maze of case laws. This involves much more research than you see in a Y category HEC paper. As for the fact that he never wrote an essay, well, this is something where if he hasn't seen any literature on Mr. Jinnah, it can't be helped. The first publication concerning Jinnah was edited by Sarojini Naido which was called Muhammad Ali Jinnah, his speeches and writings, published in Madras, publisher Ganesh, the year 1918, more than 100 years ago. And lately, Ahmad Saeed has published this book, The Writings of Qaeda Azam, 
Lahore Nazaria Pakistan Trust 2014. It contains 20 essays of Mr. Jinnah. You are saying he never wrote an essay. Here are before the camera, before your eyes, 20 essays. He didn't have an idea of Pakistan. I'm sorry, although many of you believe that he did, he did not. Yes. The audience here will applaud what he said on the 11th of August 1947. But do they want to hear what he said in the frontier where he said, you are Muslims first and Indians second. And this was before Pakistan was formed. In 1948, here in Karachi, at addressing the Bar Council, he said, this will be a land where Islamic law will be applied. Uh, Mr. Dr. Hulboy's accusation that Mr. Jinnah had no idea of Pakistan is not correct. Unless a person has an idea of the state he is championing, he cannot define it. Not Mr. Dr. Hoothboy, but many others have said that Mr. Jinnah never defined Pakistan, so whatever he achieved, he could describe as Pakistan. Or he would, he kept the concept vague so he, it would attract the larger, it's not true. While the Jinnah Gandhi talks were taking place in Bombay in 1944. The representative of the Associated Press of America asked him to define Pakistan. Mr. Jishwam Jinnah defined it first geographically. He said it would consist of Sindh, Baluchistan, Northwest Frontier Province and Punjab in the West and Bengal and Assam in the East. These were all Muslim majority provinces. That provinces were later divided or partitioned was not due to Mr. Jinnah's demand. Secondly, Mr. Jinnah said, politically, Pakistan will be a democracy. Economically, Mr. Jinnah said, a lot of people don't know it, so let me quote here directly. He personally hoped that major industries and services in Pakistan would be socialized. Now see here the reference. Jabir Uddin Ahmad's speeches and statements, speeches and writings of Mr. Jinnah, Lahore, Muhammad Darshaf, 1976, volume 2, page 231. Here is Mr. Jinnah's definition of Pakistan. So he had a concept. He had a concept when he proposed the Lucknow Pact. He had a concept, he had an idea when the Delhi Muslim proposals 1927 were accepted and even ratified by Congress. They only went back upon it in the Nehru report. He knew what he was doing when he proposed the 12th May solution. And he also knew what the 16th May state paper, that is the cabinet information plan, meant. And in any case, Liaqat Ali Khan had given him a typescript, giving him reasons why the Muslim League should not accept the cabinet mission plan. The two main points that Liaqat Ali Khan had made that the coercive power of uh, the state, the army, the police, they would be in the hands of the Congress. And the autonomy promised to Muslim areas under the cabinet mission plan would be wiped out once the British left. Even after reading that, even after reading that, you will find that in a volume I edited for the Pakistan Study Center called the Jinnah Liaqat Correspondence. He 
made the proposal on 12th May which said that Muslim group of provinces and Hindu group of provinces would be there with the common center which would act as a managing agency for foreign affairs, defense and communication necessary for defense. He didn't want the center to have powers of taxation and he didn't want the center to have a legislation. To that the cabinet delegation did not agree and on 16th May they said the center would have to have a legislature, they said the center would have to have power of taxation. Still Mr. Jinnah accepted the 16th May state paper. It was when Mr. Nehru in his 10th July 1946 press conference in Bombay said that he was not bound by the cabinet mission plan that the Muslim League reassembled and withdrew the acceptance. Indeed, I can show you here in uh, Cripps version that when Sir Stafford Cripps received the Congress uh, acceptance of the cabinet mission plan, he said, I only hope that they have not uh, filled it with so many conditions and caveats that it really amounts to a refusal. And that is exactly what happened. Mahatma Gandhi extracted a promise as he said in his report to King George the Sixth from the Secretary of State uh, Lord Patrick Lawrence that the cabinet mission plan would be in the nature of a recommendation not an award that had to be implemented and Patrick Lawrence agreed. When the withdrawal of the cabinet mission plan resulted in the plan for partition, then the Congress turned again and said no, the cabinet mission plan should be enforced as an award. It was the Congress who were confused. There was a confusion between the, act, the former president of the Congress, Maulana Azad, the actual president of the Congress, Jawaharlal Nehru and Mahatma Gandhi, who at least three times had tried to remove Azaz from the presidentship. At least three times. So, it does not lie here. Then, what does he say? Ah, you have the Let's go to the fifth thing. Achha. How would Pakistan survive in a world where science and technology is what makes countries strong? He had no plans for that. And so Pakistan was born in a state of confusion. Dr. Parvez Hulboy's accusation that Mr. Jinnah had no plans, especially for science and technology, is again based on what should I say of an eminent professor? Ignorance. For reference, see Khalid Shamsul Hassan's book, The Qais Unrealized Dream, which uh, set up uh, Muslim League set up a uh, planning commission in December 1943. And uh, let us see what the subcommittees were. Subcommittee 7 was for fuel and power. Subcommittee 8 was for mining and metallurgy and subcommittee 9 was for chemical industries. Does that not cover planning for science and technology? In 1943, he set it up. Pakistan's assets were withheld, its areas were taken from it, its strategic assets were taken to it. That is why. Khalid Shamsul Hassan, a great benefactor of mine, personal benefactor. Uh, he took this out from the Shamsul Hassan paper his father had brought at great risk to his life in Pakistan. So, here it is. Here, here, see these. The headings of the subcommittees. See them. Focus on them. And it goes on. 
So, making fun founder organizations, there was no planning, we were planning committee from 43 onwards, it had several meetings and it was not confined to uh, Muslim League members, scientists, professors had been inducted. Even Dr. Zakir Hussain was anything but a Muslim leaguer was inducted. Economists were inducted, professors were inducted. The professors who wrote uh, research papers, they were inducted for economies. And here you say very blandly that he had no planning, there was no planning, which is very, very unkind for Dr. Parvez who boy to, re, to use his considerable reputation to tar the image of the country and its founder. Today, we do not need an ideology for Pakistan. Countries survive without ideologies. Holland has no ideology, nor does Japan. Ideology. Dr. Parvez Boy says that ideology is not necessary for a country. Now, the person who coined the term Antoine de, Strat, de Strasi, he called ideology the science of idea. Now, with so much emphasis on science, with so much emphasis on <laughs> ideas, he is saying that Jinnah had no idea of Pakistan. Why is he opposed to ideology? Then, there is another definition closer to home, and that is by Dr. Iqbal Ahmad. Dr. Iqbal Ahmad says that ideology is the value commitment of a country. So, a country should not have a value commitment. I am sure that Dr. Parvez Hudboy knows uh, an eminent person as Dr. Iqbal Ahmad. The Trasi is history, Dr. Iqbal Ahmad is our contemporary. So, What's the objection to ideology? And that confusion should have ended in 1971 when the two-nation theory went into the Bay of Bengal. It should have gotten, we should have gotten rid of the two-nation theory then. It makes absolutely no sense today. It is nonsense today. So I can be arrested for that? Yes? So those in the... <laughs> Dr. Parvez boy says that the two nation theory was drowned in the Gulf of Bengal. Actually, this phrase is not originally his, it is Mrs. Indra Gandhi's phrase. But let us go into it in depth. What is the background? In uh, 1947, when it was decided by the Congress resolution that Bengal and Punjab were to be partitioned, the leaders of Bengal, Hussain Shahid Sorba, the, the Chief Minister of Bengal, Kiran Shankar Roy, the leader of the opposition, and Sarath Bose, the brother of Subhash Chandra Bose, they set up a committee and made a proposal for a united and independent Bengal when the Lahore resolution said sovereign and autonomous. Now, sovereign and autonomous are not equal terms. And the people who drafted the resolution were constitutional lawyers. This ambiguity was left deliberately because it was the delegate from Bengal, Murbi Abdul Haq, Fazlul Haq, who was presenting it. So, when Mr. Suharwardi went to Mr. Jinnah, see this book, uh, The Great Divide, and see the unfinished memoirs by Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, in both it is stated very clearly that when Mr. Suharwardi 
proposed a sovereign, independent and united Bengal, Mr. Jinnah readily agreed. Even Mahatma Gandhi agreed. But Jawaharlal Nehru would not agree. Vallabhai Patel would not agree. Vallabhai Patel phoned again. Sarat Chandar Bose and said, Mr. Bose, this is Sheikh Mujibur Rahman writing. I have the reference here. I can't take out every book. Mr. Bose, don't be mad. We want Calcutta. And Mr. Sarat Chandar Bose issued a press statement revealing this. And in that statement, it was admitted that Mr. Jinnah had accepted the proposal. If an independent Bengal had been allowed to emerge in 1947, none of the events that Dr. Parvez, whose boy decries, would have taken place. We will come to that later. He is not entirely clear about that also. He gives a one-sided account. When Pandit Nehru turned down the proposal of a united and independent Bengal, he had told Sir Eric Mayweather there was no question of Hindus there agreeing to live under permanent Muslim domination. I repeat, Nehru said that there was no question of the Hindus there agreeing to live under permanent Muslim domination, who had only a 5% majority. I ask you, is this not the two-nation theory? If Muslims refuse to live under permanent Hindu domination, it's the two-nation theory. And if Hindus refuse to live under permanent 5% Muslim domination, it's not a true nation theory. It is this true nation theory of Jawahar Nehru, Jawahar Lal Nehru, that has been drowned in the Bay of Bengal. Look at the Rohingya crisis. What is the, what is Mamta Banerjee saying? The Chief Minister of West Bengal is saying there is no Bangladesh. There is West Bengal and East Bengal. So what does that country exist on? Not religious nationalism, not linguistic nationalism. Then what is it? When the Indian Prime Minister Manmohan Singh visited Bangladesh, uh, Mrs. Mamta Banerjee refused to visit with him. And when did, where do I have the reference? You know the basic reference for all that we, all of us write about partition and freedom are the transfer of power papers, 12 volumes of 1200 pages, each thick big ones. I only have some volumes of the Congress papers and uh, the Muslim League papers and the uh, Constituent Assembly debates because I am a private individual. This is not a public library, this is a private library. So when Mr. Nehru was talking to Sir Eric Miyabi and saying, highlighting the difference between Hindu domination and Muslim domination. This is in the transfer of power papers, London Her Majesty Stationery Office, 1981, volume 10, page 1013. The whole set of the transfer of power papers is in the Sindh archives in the Pakistan Study Center, I think also in the General History Library of the University of Karachi. Then it, Pandit Nehru knew fully what he was doing because his other statement was East Bengal would be a source of embarrassment for Pakistan. It was not for the love of Bengal but for the hatred of Pakistan that he blocked the independence of Bengal. Just now and the reference for Nehru saying that East Bengal would be a 
source of embarrassment of Pakistan was again the transfer of power papers volume 11 1982 page 3 just above my fingers I am giving everything that everybody who sees it can check for himself or herself to address Bangladesh I want to address it because that is not allowed in our official narrative all we hear is that it was it was conspiracies and there couldn't be a bigger nonsense than that we mistreated the Bengalis we thought of them as lesser people we exploited them and then we massacred them why don't we talk about that now if Muslims could always live in peace together the next slide which is about Bangladesh the emergence of Bangladesh. He says, we exploited, we mistreated, and we massacred the people of Bangladesh. How did we exploit? Were there any industries in East Pakistan before Pakistan came into being? The whole industrial base of Bangladesh was laid during the Pakistan experiment as they call it. It was the people there grew jute but they lacked the capital. All the jute mills were in Calcutta. Sirish Kumar Chattopadhyay told Liyakas Ali Khan on the floor of the house that we cannot break our links with Calcutta. For this reason, jute was in East, Park, East Bengal and Melbourne and West Bengal. So we invested. We created a middle class. Liyakat Ali Khan removed all the hindrances that the British had put to the recruitment of Bengalis to the armed forces. He put a 50% quota in the civil service for people of the Eastern Bank is this exploitation. Today, when we are asking people to come and invest in Pakistan, should we say that Unilever is exploiting Pakistan, Baiko is exploiting Pakistan, Racket and Bannister is exploiting Pakistan, should you say that? No. Within 25 years, there was only one member of the 22 families. But he was not the only Bengali member of a jute mill. Many Bengalis became members, the owners of jute mills. The first massacre took place in 1940. 54 in the Ardemji Jutmus, after which the people complained that no Mahajir is safe in Bengal. And these Mahajirs did not go on their own. Sheikh Mujibur Rahman himself, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman himself took two train loads of the effectives of the Bihar riots with him in 1946. He didn't tell them beforehand that I am taking you to Bengal, but you'll have to give up Urdu. He didn't tell them that at that time. Then, let me read to you. Let me read to you. If I say something, I am a Pakistani and I am a Muslim. You can suspect me of bias. I am reading you a passage written by S.A. Karim, who was the first foreign secretary of Bangladesh. Leave aside other ethnic. Sheikh Mujibur Rahman came back because there were attacks on Muhammadpur. The Bihari locality or 
so called Bihari locality built in 1960. Let me quote S.A. Kareem, Sheikh Mujib, Triumph and Tragedy, Taka, the University Press, year 2005, page 284. Bengalis in Dhaka began to vent their wrath on non-Bengalis. Violence soon spread to other towns of East Pakistan. The subcontinent had a history of communal riots and it was not altogether surprising that bad feelings against Biharis should set off communal violence. There were massacres of Biharis. He talks about massacres. There were massacres of Biharis in Dhaka, Chittagong and Khulna by mob. Here is the reference. See, here is the reference. I am not talking about Masmani. I am not talking about Matiwa Rahman. I am not talking about Sarmila Bos or Yasmin Saikia. I am talking about an intimate of Bangabundu. So, from the 1st of March to the 5th, 25th of March, ethnic cleansing of non-Bengalis and in Mehman Singh, uh, Flight Lieutenant Safi Mustafa and his full formation was massacred by what uh, are called undisciplined mobs. No one survived. So a military formation was butchered by unarmed, undisciplined mobs. If the army had not acted on the 25th of March, even those non-Bengalis or so-called non-Pakistanis who are still languishing in the camps of Bangladesh would not have even survived. Whatever we did was wrong. But any one-sided verdict is wrong. Matiur Rahman Nizami, the head of the Jamaat Islami of Bangladesh, was my class fellow for three years, and be honest. I, you know our class fellow very well. He didn't have the temperament to even slaughter a chicken. And you accused him of the un-Islamic crimes of murder, arson and rape. And you hanged him. There's nobody to ask about them, you cite the unwanted Biharis. They are not human beings, of course, are they? So their killing doesn't count. There was a riot in Chittagong in 1968. Reference to it has slipped into the British papers, the American papers edited by Rajat Khan, because the typist wrote 1966 instead of 1968 by mistake. Otherwise, Rizad Khan was himself the information secretary at the time these massacres were playing and it was he who prevented their appearance in the press during the regime of General Yahya Khan. I am not condoning the sufferings of Bengalis. But we didn't start it and we didn't suffer and we didn't suffer the less. So a battered, humiliated, insulted nation to keep kicking it. What was the argument? Arundhati Rai said, yeah, you intervened in Bangladesh because of the massacre. What is your argument for Kashmir now? Why does Dr. Pervez boy always keep on saying that we should accept the line of control as a compromise.
This is not a country that was made for the armed forces of Pakistan. This is a country that was made for its people. His ninth statement. Dr. Parvez Uzboy says that Pakistan was not created for the armed forces of Pakistan. Really? Liaqat Ali Khan had told Lord Mountbatten that the Muslim League would refuse to accept Pakistan, to accept power in Pakistan unless there was an army on the spot because Claude Auchinleck had delayed the division of the armed forces although a plan for the division of armed forces had been drawn up by General Sir Francis Tucker, the commander of East Command after the, immediately after the great cattle killing. Auchinleck did not act upon it. He admitted he had a plan. When the Kashmir War took place, the organization of the Pakistan Army wasn't even complete. Only 70% of the Pakistan Army belonged to this soil and was Muslim. 30% were Hindus belonging to Indian areas. So, look at what is happening today. Mr. Ayaz Sajak made a statement which concerned the efficiency of the Pakistan Air Force. Who was the proper man to respond the relevant functionary? was the Director General of the Inter-Services Public Relations and he did it. This is the atmosphere in the Chief of Army Staff has reassured the Chairman of the Pakistan People's Party. Is it an army of occupation? Like the 90,000 Indian troops in Kashmir? Who dies at the borders? So, this is a very unkind suggestion. It was not made for the... You see, there's one book Military Inc. And there's another book published by Sama by Dr. Talas Bizaras which says that in a country where capital is not forthcoming, when capital formation is difficult, where investment is shy, if the army or the armed forces or the Fauji Foundation, whatever you call it, gives, puts money and gives a lift up to the infrastructure. What is wrong with it? The Karakoram Highway, if it had been built by private, uh, they consume, private contractors instead of the Pakistan Army, the whole CPEC would be full of what was at the University Road in Karachi. So don't don't talk like that. Don't talk like that. I had that book, I read the book. Um, she's the daughter of uh, a novelist. But then Talat Vizadar was in the IBA 
Institute of Development Economics and she knew what uh, her book has been published by Sama in Karachi. Read that also. Now the tenth and the final. It's about Balochistan. What is happening there? Do you know that Chuck Hagel had uh, his confirmation as Secretary of Defense in the United States delayed because of his statement that India was creating trouble for Pakistan through Afghanistan. According to the same report, C. Christine Fair, who has written this diatribe against the Pakistan army, she had also made the point that India creates trouble for Pakistan to Afghanistan and she was heckled. After she was heckled for saying that, she came up with this book. It is surprising how people first speak against India and become members of the India caucus. Or is this not surprising? So, if we are misreading Afghanistan, it should allow to be to secede, and India can mistreat the Kashmiris, and we should accept the line of control as the border. Is that what we should think? Is that what we should decide? Now. If I say more, then nobody will feel the need to buy my book. And a few words about the books. It has three sections. The first section is Western Writers on Jinnah. Here all the books and all the available essays in World Writings on the Qazi Azam, in a book I edited for Oxford University Press in 2005, M.A. Jena, Views and Reviews, the books of, you see them here, up there, all the books. No, no, uh, so many books, the first book was written uh, in, uh, that is, the political Stafford William Stafford Mess. There, there, there. Uh, the, the purple one. Purple one. Yeah. That was the first book. It was defended in 1952. Then came Hector Bolitho. And then came Stanley Walpert. Then came Iron Bryant Wells. And then there are much many more. Indian writers, I have covered only the books. For Indian writers, I haven't covered essays, only books. Contrast them. Someday, I put them in one volume. Say, so you can contrast with what Pakistani writers have written, and you will find that Indian writers, on the whole, have been more appreciative of the role played by Muhammad Ali Jinnah than Pakistani writers. Many Pakistani writers. There is one thing we need to guard. We need to count our blessings. And we should not deny the bounties. We are in a miserable condition. Pakistan, it was predicted by the British by Mountbatten, 
would collapse in six months because it was not economically viable. Even the, from the times of Liaqadri Khan, this unviable state became a prosperous state. In the 21st century, we made this prosperous state into a very impoverished state. That is not the fault of the farmers. I hope that you will give me a fair chance. Everybody read M.A. Jina, the outside view and especially the latest chapter which covers the ground I have covered here, the speech of Dr. Parvez Hulboy and give me a fair chance. And again, while we ending this course, I must renew my gratitude to Mr. Javed Jabbar, whose own book has been launched recently now because of COVID-3. You know, I have been a victim of COVID myself. We can't have uh, book launches like before with a crowd milling around. We have to have it on the web. We have to have it online. So, here with the help of our esteemed host, I sign off. Thank you.